What is up, everyone? My name is Lauren Wilson. I am an Arizona School of Ministry student. I will be finishing up my schooling here at the end of 2024. And today, I just wanted to dive into one of the first homework assignments that we ever had. I wanted to pose a question. I wanted to communicate my thoughts through this medium of YouTube. And if you feel the need to, or if you feel like you want to participate, I would love to hear your comments and your thoughts on this prompt because it made me really think deeply and reflect. And I feel like I got a lot of fruit out of reflecting on this prompt. And, and what the question was that was posed to us is what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So again, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And so before I kind of get into my thoughts for today, I did want to say a couple things about my purpose behind this channel, my goals behind this channel, and so a little bit of my philosophy on Christian theology. So I have always believed in God, but I wasn't always a follower of Christ. I didn't really understand the religious rituals and kind of what the point of having someone preach at me was and, and feeling judged or understanding tithing and, and these other religious concepts. However, um, why I created this channel is as I dove into scripture and I kind of went on my own journey, I realized that a lot of that stuff is, is man-made. The New Testament doesn't really say that we need to go to a big mega church and give our money to churches and it doesn't say to judgy people it doesn't say to convict people or condemn people or anything like that w really what the new testament says is all we're supposed to do is love god with all our mind all our heart all our soul and not to judge anyone and to spread love to all corners of the earth and that we're all going to fall short of the glory of god and that we all need his saving grace and then as we come short in our human form he offers us forgiveness and he offers us repentance. And then also with regards to the tithing, I see then 1 Thessalonians 2.9, Apostle Paul says to the church in Thessalonia, he says, For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. And so what Apostle Paul is saying in this scripture to the church of Thessalonia is, I will work and I will labor and I will toil and make my own money. That way there is no taintedness in my message of trying to spread the gospel. And I don't want to paint a blurry picture here because in 1 Corinthians, Apostle Paul does say that it's okay that if your vocation and your job is to spread the gospel, it's okay to accept wages. However, Apostle Paul himself tried his hardest not to take wages from people for spreading the gospel, for spreading the good news. And I personally want to try to follow in Apostle Paul's footsteps. If you are a part of a church and you do take tithing, I completely understand, and it is biblical in a way. However, pushing it on people, in my view, in this scripture from Apostle Paul, it's not biblical to push tithing and it's not biblical to push judgment. And so my goal for this channel is to have constructive conversations with the de church, the unchurch, those that have suffered church hurt, to create a safe space to be honest, to be open, to be vulnerable, to be transparent, and not be afraid to wrestle with some of the hardest questions. I feel like as Christians, we tend to just focus on all the goody-goody stuff, like let's be sad, Jesus loves us, it's okay, don't worry. But we don't talk about the hard things. We don't talk about the genocide. We don't talk about the rape. We don't talk about the murder. We don't talk about the homosexuality. We want to, to condemn and convict a lot, but when we get pushed back on, we tend to curl up in a ball, and I don't think that's constructive from either side of the party. And so what this channel is trying to do, what this channel is striving to do, is to create a safe space for constructive conversation to go after truth, because I truly believe that if we go after truth, 
it will set you free. And what that means can be unpacked because we've been wrestling with that for thousands of years. But for right now, let's leave it at this. We're trying to maximize our well-being in our human experience for what we know and within ourselves and then across people and across time. So going back to the prompt, and I'm sorry if I'm speaking fast or anything like that, but back to the prompt. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And so I have my paper in front of me right here, and I'm just going to kind of read it and then pause and, and try to read my thoughts. And then again, I want to hear some of, some of y'all's thoughts. And so what I wrote for this paper is the following. Before delving into this prompt is integral to elaborate upon the word important. And using our material finite brain to broaden a definition of what a God is across a diverse range of populations. Christians, non-Christians, atheists, and theists. And so what I'm trying to do in this opening paragraph is God is a universal term. When we hear the word God and it evokes a certain emotion inside of us, and the problem is when we're when we're speaking to different with people with different worldviews, that word may not mean the same thing to everybody because of their perspective and their perception and the way they're they're analyzing it through their perceptual lens. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to set up my thoughts to find a common ground. Is there some sort of commonality between Christians, non Christians, atheists, and theists? Theus, some sort of commonalities in our definitions of God. And so moving on to the next paragraph, for something to be important implies that there is some sort of fundamental way of living, right or correct, that is separate from ourselves as humans. Importance implies a moral standard of living that in our world, some things are more important or have more intrinsic value than other things. What is even important? Why is what is important even important? How does something even derive meaning or value to become important? The very question itself has to be nested in something above or outside of ourselves. For myself at this current time with my limited material brain, importance means that there's a way of living that maximizes the well-being at the individual level and then from there, the community societal level at large. I believe it can be agreed upon by rational actors that to be alive in whatever maximizes being alive across people across time is important. Importance in this sense, because being alive is having energy as a conscious being, can be measured in a very scientific or even tangible way through phys physiological and psychological markers. Are the choices we are making maximizing the well-being of individuals and societies at large in over expanded periods of time? So are we maximizing human flourishing, which in Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control or discipline, considering on what translations you're reading from. And so I believe that human flourishing, that those nine fruit of the Spirit are a good definition of human flourishing and trying to have as many of those types of emotions in our life across time as possible, moving away from other emotions such as anger, bitterness, envy, jealousy, hate, resentment, and wrath. And so moving on in the paper, I believe this is what makes something valuable and thus important. Even this concept of importance, though, has to exist outside of ourselves because why is it even important to maximize our well-being? Why is that even sown into our hearts? Why not just let everyone be anxious, depressed, and sick if importance doesn't even exist outside of ourselves, however it's sown into us and onto our hearts? Why should I care about someone else's well-being why should i care if someone else is anxious or depressed what what is it intrinsically inside of me that gives them value from a pure evolutionary 
standpoint, if it's survival of those that can adapt the best, then if someone is sick, that's less competition for me to have to compete with over resources. And so from an evolutionary standpoint, it doesn't quite make sense. However, someone might say, well, we're social beings because in packs and in tribes, we increase our probability of being able to hunt together. And we can also, if someone is anxious or depressed, etc., they might have something if we keep them alive and we can get them back on the right track. Well, then they can contribute to the overall success of us getting food and getting more resources and unlocking their consciousness. I don't know though. That is that is a, a pushback, but it doesn't it doesn't really make the most sense. It's like, well, if someone's a vegetable, why, from an evolutionary standpoint, should we care about the dignity of their human spirit unless something transcendent and something outside of us says it is good to value them? And what the Bible says is that every single person is made in the image of of God. So inherently this this revolutionary concept because the canon was written thousands of years ago when slavery was way more was way rampant. We still have slavery today and slavery then was very rampant and the social hierarchies then were very very extreme. And so for this idea to emerge that every single being on earth was made in the image of God and has a divine spark and a divine value in them, regardless of their background, regardless of their race, regardless of their wealth, regardless of their societal standing. That is a revolutionary idea for someone to come up with and then for it to spread across the world. And it's so revolutionary that we don't even practice it fully Today, we still have child slaves that make cobalt for our iPhones. We still have child slaves in our supply chains for our clothes. We still have people sleeping in the streets. We still do not take care of our veterans. So this idea that we take for granted, especially in the Western world, that every single person has divine value is a very radical idea that I don't personally believe humans could come up with personally. And so let's go ahead back to the paper. Like I was saying, importance doesn't exist outside of ourselves and it's sewn into us. So again, next next paragraph. If importance or what gives something meaning value lives outside of us, this leads to a follow-up question. What outside of us created this meaning value that lives outside of us? Why was it created? And if there is a right or correct way of living that exists independently of us, which leads to better well-being, how do we go about seeking this out, seeking out this truth? This is where the question comes in or the prompt comes in. What is your God? We are finite beings in a world of unknown, seemingly infinite information that overwhelms our finite nature. To survive, literally, we have to go about organizing, reorganizing, and catharsizing this information on a regular basis or purging this information on a regular basis, releasing emotions, releasing information that is not as relevant, remembering information that is relevant, reframing information so it doesn't cause emotional trauma, etc. To organize information is to assign importance to it. To assign importance to something is to create a hierarchy. Importance and hierarchy implies that which I hold in the highest regard is at the top of it. This comes down to ranking one's values to be able to navigate the world of unknown, seemingly infinite information. It is assumed that a rational actor acts in a certain ma manner because they believe that their action is going to lead to a positive outcome in their life. What is positive is derived from their concept of importance, which is a hierarchy of value, and the top of that hierarchy of value is, by definition, one's God. So from a Christian standpoint, God is the highest, most transcendent, infinite, omnipresent being slash force that exists 
other theists as well. That's also what they believe. That's the highest thing. And so non-Christians and atheists, the commonality between something that is God is what is at the top of your value hierarchy that's helping you navigate or orient yourself through the infinite potential of the unknown future. What information are you keeping because you believe it's important based off your worldview and your perceptions, and by definition, that which you hold of highest value is your God, the top of your value hierarchy. So whether you're a Christian, a non-Christian, atheist, or theist, by definition, you act out your greatest value, moral, and ethic. And your actions imply your concept of importance. And this is your embodiment of your greatest value, moral, ethic. This is your God. Therefore, God is one's perception of meaning, purpose, values in the world. God is one's lamp that lights their path. Whatever your God is affects the thoughts you have and the actions you take, and thus the quality of your life and the quality of those around you. Without a moral ethic value system that maximizes the well-being of individuals physiologically, psychologically, across societies, across time, you will have poverty. Spiritual poverty, financial poverty, chaos, and strife. This is why it is important. By believing something is important, you have by default admitted something greater than us made it important. To seek to understand the attributes of your God. For what comes in your mind when you think about God literally directs your entire being and the direction of all of humankind and human history. This is not something to take lightly or just rest upon, which is why you must continually seek it, renew it, and wrestle with it. It is also important to note that most of our days are unconscious habits. That again implies that we default towards that which we put the most repetition towards. You repeat most what you find most valuable. What is most valuable is at the top of your value hierarchy. What is at the top of your value hierarchy is your God. Therefore, your default unconscious habits that are literally coded into your nervous system are your concepts of God. Your aim at God, your thoughts on God, will directly impact, impact the habitual patterns in your life. And again, the quality of your life as measured by very real, tangible physiological, and psychological markers. And so that's why it's important to slow down and to ask yourself, what is my highest value? What is my highest moral? What is my highest guiding ethic? And what am I trying to do on a day-to-day -day basis to reinforce that? What do I think it is? And how do I act? And are those congruent with each other or those in a paradox to each other? And then again, as Christians, the two greatest commandments in the Great Commission, the greatest commandments are love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. And another one just like it, Jesus says, is to love your neighbor as yourself. And then the Great Commission is to spread the gospel or the good news to all corners of the earth that God loves you and that you should strive to love God, and you should tr strive to love your neighbor as yourself, and serve them with a humble, servant, loving spirit. And so if that's your highest aim, and you think it, how are you acting that out? How are you encoding that to the deepest parts of your nervous system? And if that is a worthy highest aim, that is what the Christian Bible says. That is what the Gospels say. And the reason I point that out is because before I was a follower of Christ personally, I was very spiritual. However, I wasn't very religious. And now I know that Christians don't believe in religion. We believe in relationship. I believed in God, but I would always meditate on these concepts of love and service and kindness. And then as I dove into scripture, I realized that that's what Jesus was saying all along. And it makes sense because in Romans, it says that the law is written on our heart. So even if you've never heard the gospel, even if you've never heard scripture, God has written the law into our hearts and onto our conscience. And so you have some sort of discernment and some sort of relationship with the divine, even without the canonical text. And so 
I know that I was kind of speeding there, and this was my first time to to do this. But if you've watched this far, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. I will get uh, a lot better at this. I didn't really get to show my my silly side because I do have a really goofy side, and I know that um sometimes in this medium you can tend to just show your serious side. But I I just again I want to never force a belief system or force a value system on on anybody. It truly is coming from a place of, I just want to have constructive conversations. I really do love human beings. I love my human family. And I, and I want to see as many of us live as beautiful a life as, as possible. And I, and I believe that it's possible. But I, I've come to understand that it takes constructive conversations. It takes having tough adult conversations. It takes listening not only to to others' opinions and thoughts, but listening to your own conscious and trying to speak out loud. And, and I'll leave this video with this. It was put on my heart that think about constructive conversation. So by definition, in a world of infinite information, we are very finite, limited information processing machines. So my brain can only process so much information. That means that your brain or your personal experience, you have information that I don't have. You have a perception and you have a reality and you have a piece of the truth that I don't have. So that's the thing is I have a piece of the puzzle of truth. You have a piece of the puzzle of truth. But what makes constructive conversations so hard is we don't always fully understand our own truth let alone someone else's truth. So within our own selves, we have to wrestle with our truth and being able to embody and communicate our truth to someone else and discern it. And then that person's doing the same thing. And then through communication, through the word, I take my puzzle piece, yet you take your puzzle piece and we wrestle and we construct together and we and I leave a part of my what I thought was truth behind because I realized it wasn't actually truth and you do the same thing and then together we put our pieces together and we make a higher level of truth but that only comes through patient humble loving servant constructive conversation so thank you again my name is Lauren Wilson Arizona School of Ministry student if you thought this video was was good, you got some value out of it, please tell your friends about it. Please hit like, please hit subscribe, please leave your comments below. It would mean the world to me, your time and your energy. That is the most valuable resource that any of us has. Money, you can make more money. Time and energy, as far as we know, you will not get it back on this earth, but if you do believe, you will just move your life to a different setting, dwelling place in heaven. So thank you so much. I love you all, and God bless.